Chapter 9 Life at Weybridge was not happy. I became an air raid warden. One other warden became very jealous and did everything he could to cause me harm. I offered to resign, but it was not wanted for me to resign. One night there was an air raid while I was at Weybridge, and after the air raid a policeman came to the door. It seemed that a small light, hardly large enough for anyone to notice from a hundred feet away, was showing. There was a faulty switch in the flat, on the landing. It was one of those old brass switches with the great knob, and I suppose the vibration caused by the banging and all that had shaken it just to the on position. The policeman could see for himself that if a fly sneezed the light would come on because the spring in the tumbler was defective. But no, the light was showing. That's all there was to it. So there was a court appearance and a fine and that is a thing I have resented ever since, because it was so utterly unnecessary, and the enemy, Warden, was the one who had reported it. After that I resigned from the ARP, believing that if people could not work together, then it was better to break us, the party. At Weybridge I was supposed to do everything, answer letters, persuade people to take correspondence courses, maintain the boss's cars, and he was always changing the darn things, act as unpaid messenger boy, and do anything which came to hand, all for five pounds a week. People were getting called up, conditions were becoming more difficult, food was getting shorter and shorter, and from the aircraft factory at Brooklands there was always strange noises. One day a Wellington was being flight tested, and it crashed just beside the village of Weybridge. The pilot saved the village at the cost of his own life, because he crashed the plane upon the electrified railway line. The plane was like a toy that had been snapped into a thousand pieces. It was scattered all over the place, but the people of Weybridge were saved because of the self-sacrifice of the pilot. Just at this time I received my call-up papers. I had to go before a board of medical examiners as a formality before entering one of the services. On the appointed day I went to the great hall where there were crowds of other men waiting to be examined. I said to the attendant there, I've had TB, you know. He looked at me and said, You look a bit of a wreck, I must say, lad. Sit over there. So I sat where directed, and I sat, and I sat. Eventually, when nearly everyone else in the place had been examined, the panel of doctors turned to me. What's this? said one. You say you've got TB? Do you know what TB is? I certainly do, sir, I said. I've had it. He asked me a lot of questions, and then grumphed and grumphed. Then he had a word with his associates. At last he turned back to me as if he was making the greatest decision in the world. I am sending you to Kingston Hospital, he said. They will examine you there. You will soon find out if you got TB or not, and if you haven't, God help you. He carefully filled out a form, sealed it, put it in another envelope and sealed that, and then flung it at me. I picked it up off the floor and made my way home. Next day I told my employer that I had to go to the hospital for examination. He appeared absolutely bored. I got the impression that he thought, oh, why does the fellow waste my time? Why doesn't he join up and get out of my sight? However, I got through my work that day, and on the day after, as directed, I took the bus to Kingston-on-Thames. I made my way to a hospital there. I had all sorts of tests, and then I was x-rayed. After the x-ray I was shoved in a drying cupboard where a lot of wet x-rays were hung up to dry out. After half an hour a woman came and said, OK, you can go home. That was all. Nothing more was said. So I just went home. Next there came a summons to go to the TB clinic at Weybridge. Of course, this was about three or four weeks later. But the summons came, and off I went to the TB clinic like a good little boy. By now I was heartily sick of the whole affair. At the TB clinic I was seen by a most wonderful doctor, who was indeed all that a doctor should be. He had my x-rays there, and he agreed with me that it was utterly stupid that I should be shunted from one department to another. He said it was perfectly obvious that I had bad lung scars through TB, and, he said, if I got in the army I would be a liability, not an asset. Surely England hadn't come to a state when they are called upon to enlist those who are obviously ill. I shall send a report to say that you are unfit for service of any kind, he said. 
Time went by, and at last I received a card in the post telling me that I would not be required for military service because I was classed as grade four, the lowest grade there was. I took the card to my employer and showed it to him, and he seemed to think that, well, he got somebody to carry on with the work if all the others were called up. There was a frantic scramble in those days of people trying to get deferment. Everybody was trying to get deferment. The man who was manager under the employer left to get another job, and another man was appointed as manager, but he and I didn't get on at all. We just did not get on at all. He was of a type that I thoroughly disliked, and I seemed to be of a type that he thoroughly disliked. However, I did the best I could, but things were becoming more and more difficult, because there was more and more work without any increase in pay. It was obvious that someone was rushing around to the employer telling tales, etc., not necessarily true tales either. One day after work, I was just meandering through the garden. We had a garden of three and a half acres, and I was passing through a little wooded copse. It was evening and growing dusk. Somehow I tripped over an exposed root and went down with a horrible thunk. Literally it jerked me out of myself. I stood upright, but then, God bless my soul, I found that I wasn't me because I was standing upright and my body was lying flat on its face. I looked about in utter amazement, and I saw some strange-looking people around me. Monks, I thought. What the devil are monks doing here? I looked at them, and I looked at, well, I suppose it was my body on the ground. But then I got a voice or something in my head. First I had the impression that it was some strange foreign lingo, but, as I thought about it, I discovered that I could understand what was being said. Young man, the voice said in my head, you are thinking of an evil matter. You are thinking of doing away with your life. That is a very bad thing indeed. Suicide is wrong, no matter the cause, no matter the imagined reason or excuse. Suicide is always wrong. All right for you, I thought. You haven't any troubles like I have. Here I am in this well, I had an awful job, not to put in words the exact description of the place, and I can't get a rise, and my boss seems to have taken a dislike to me. Why should I stay here? There are plenty of trees about, and a nice rope to throw over. But I'm not saying too much about this, because a thought was put in my mind, saying that if I wanted to, I could get release from what I considered to be the tortures of earth. If I was really serious... I could do something for mankind by making my body available to some ghost or spirit which wanted to hop in almost before I had hopped out. It seemed a lot of rubbish to me, but I thought I would give it a whirl and let them talk on. First, they said, as a sign of genuine interest, I had to change my name. They told me a strange name they wanted me to adopt, but, well, I told my wife only that I was going to change my name. She thought I was a bit mad or something, and let it go at that, and so I did change my name quite legally. Then my teeth started giving trouble. I had a horrible time. At last I couldn't stick it any longer, and I went to a local dentist. He made an attempt to extract the tooth, but it wouldn't come. He made a hole in the thing so he could use an elevator. Not the type people use to travel to different floors but the type which is meant to elevate a tooth by leverage. This dentist got on the phone and rang some specialist in London, and I had to go to a nursing home in a hurry. My wife told my employer that I had to go to a nursing home, and she was met with the statement, Well, I have to work when I have a toothache. And that was all the sympathy we got. So I went to this nursing home, at my own expense of course. There was no such thing as health schemes like you seem to have now, and I had this little operation, which was not so easy after all. The dentist was good, the anaesthetist was even better. I stayed in the nursing home a week, and then returned to Weybridge. There were quite a number of unpleasant little incidents, needlings and all that sort of thing, and unjust accusations. There is no point in going into all the details, raking up muck, because, after all, I am not a pressman. But there were false accusations, so my wife and I talked it over, and we decided that we couldn't stick it any longer, so I handed in my notice. From that moment I might have been a leper, 
or I might have had an even worse form of plague. Because for the rest of the week I sat in my office, no one came to see me. They apparently had been told not to, and no work of any kind was given to me. I just stayed there like a convict serving out time. At the end of the week, that was it. I was finished. We left Weybridge with joy, and we went to London. We moved about a bit. Oh, gracious, I forgot how many places we tried. And anyway, it doesn't matter. But then we found that conditions were intolerable, and we moved on to another place, a suburb of London called Thames Ditton. Oh, I am so anxious to get this silly affair over, because I do not enjoy talking about this. But I was in such a hurry that I have forgotten one bit. Here it is. I had been told some time before that I would have to grow a beard. Well, I thought, what's it matter? Just as well to be hung for a sheep as a lamb. So, while I was at Weybridge, I grew this beard and was jeered at quite a bit by my employer and by those who worked with me. Never mind, I thought, I wouldn't be with them much longer. We moved to Thames Ditton. For a very short time, we stayed in a lodging house which was run by a funny old woman who just could not see dirt. She thought she lived in a ducal mansion or something, and was quite incapable of seeing immense cobwebs high up in the corners of the stairway. But she was too ladylike, and so we looked for another place. Down the road there was such a place, a house which was being rented as an upper and lower flat. We took the place. We had no thought of how we were going to get money because I had no job, no job at all. Instead, I was just doing anything to earn odd bits of money to keep us alive. I went to the unemployment exchange, but because I had left my employment instead of being fired, I was not able to get any unemployment benefit. So that never have I had any unemployment money. I managed without. To this day, I don't know how, but I did. I had an old bicycle. And I used to ride around trying to get work, but no, no work was available. The war had ended, men had come back from the forces, and the labour market was saturated. It was all right for them; they had unemployment benefit and perhaps a pension. I had nothing. Then one night I was approached by a group of men. They hoiked me out of my body and talked to me, and they asked me if I still wanted to get out of my body into what I then thought was paradise. I suppose it is paradise, but these people call it the astral world. I assured them I wanted to get out even more than before, so they told me the very next day I must stay at home. One man, he was all done up in a yellow robe, took me to a window and pointed out. He said, "That tree, you must go to that tree, and put your hands up on that branch, and go to pull yourself up and then let go." He gave me the exact time at which I must do this, telling me it was utterly vital to follow instructions to the letter. Otherwise, I would have a lot of pain, and so would other people. But worse for me, I would still be left on earth. The next day, my wife thought I had gone bonkers or something because I didn't go out as usual. I pottered about, and then a minute or two before the appointed time, I went out into the garden and walked over to the tree. I pulled on a branch of ivy, or whatever it is that ivy has, and reached up to the branch as directed, and then I felt as if I had been struck by lightning. I had no need to pretend to fall. I did fall, whack down. I felt down, and then, good gracious me, I saw a silver rope sticking out of me. I went to grab it to see what it was, but gently my hands were being held away. I lay there on the ground, feeling horribly frightened. Because two people were at that silver rope, and they were doing something to it, and a third person was there with another silver rope in his hand, and horror of horrors, I could see through the whole bunch of them. So I wondered if I was seeing all this, or if I had dashed my brains out. It was all so strange. At last there was a sucking sort of noise and a plop, and then I found, oh joy of joy, I was floating free in a beautiful, beautiful world. And that means that having gone so far, I fulfilled my part of the contract. I have said all I am going to about my past life, and now I am going back to my own part of the astral world. I am Lubsang Rampa, 
and I have finished transcribing that which was so unwillingly, so ungraciously told to me by the person whose body I took over. Let me continue where he left off. His body was upon the ground, twitching slightly, and I, well, I confess without too much shame, that I was twitching also, but my twitches were caused by fright. I didn't like the look of this body stretched out there in front of me, but a Lama of Tibet follows orders, pleasant orders as well as unpleasant ones, so I stood by while two of my brother Lamas wrestled with the man's silver cord. They had to attach mine before his was quite disconnected. Fortunately, the poor fellow was in an awful state of days, and so he was quite quiescent. At last, after what seemed hours, but actually was only about a fifth of a second, they got my silver cord attached and his detached. Quickly he was led away, and I looked at that body to which I was now attached and shuddered. But then, obeying orders, I let my astral form sink down on that body which was going to be mine. Oh, the first contact was terrible, cold, slimy. I shot off in the air again in fright. Two llamas came forward to steady me, and gradually I sank again. Again I made contact, and I shivered with horror and repulsion. This truly was an incredible, a shocking experience, and one that I never want to undergo again. It seemed to be too large, or the body seemed to be too small. I felt cramped. I felt I was being squeezed to death. And the smell, the difference. My old body was tattered and dying, but at least it had been my own body. Now I was stuck in this alien thing, and I didn't like it a bit. Somehow, and I cannot explain this, I fumbled about inside, trying to get hold of the motor nerves of the brain. How did I make this confounded thing work? For a time I lay there just helpless, just as if I were paralysed. The body would not work. I seemed to be fumbling like an inexperienced driver with a very intricate car. But at last, with the help of my astral brothers, I got control of myself. I managed to make the body work. Shakily I got to my feet and nearly screamed with horror as I found that I was walking backwards instead of forward. I teetered and fell again. It was indeed a horrendous experience. I was truly nauseated by this body, and was in fear that I should not be able to manage it. I lay upon my face on the ground, and just could not move. Then, from the corner of an eye, I saw two llamas standing by, looking highly concerned at the difficulty I was having. I growled. Well, you try it for yourself. See if you can make this abominable thing do what you tell it to. Suddenly, one of the llamas said, Lobsang, your fingers are twitching. Now try with your feet. I did so, and found that there was an amazing difference between eastern and western bodies. I never would have thought such a thing possible. But then I remembered something I had heard while a ship's engineer. For ships in the western waters, the propeller should rotate in one direction, and for eastern waters it should rotate in the opposite direction. It seemed clear to me. I said to myself that I've got to start out all over again. So I kept calm and let myself lift out of the body, and from the outside I looked at it carefully. The more I looked at it, the less I liked it, but then I thought there was nothing for it but to try once again. So again I squeezed uncomfortably into the slimy, cold thing which was a western body. With immense effort I tried to rise, but fell again, and then at last I managed to scramble somehow to my feet and pressed my back against that friendly tree. There was a sudden clatter from the house and the door was flung open. A woman came running out saying, Oh, what have you done now? Come in and lie down. It gave me quite a shock. I thought of those two llamas with me and I was fearful that the woman might throw a fit at the sight of them, but obviously they were completely invisible to her and that, again, was one of the surprising things of my life. I could always see these people who visited me from the astral, but if I talked to them and then some other person came in, well, the other person thought I was talking to myself, and I didn't want to get the reputation of being off my head. The woman came towards me, and as she looked at me, a very startled expression crossed her face. I really thought she was going to get hysterical, but she controlled herself somehow and put an arm across my shoulders. 
Silently, I thought of how to control the body, and then, very slowly, thinking a step at a time, I made my way into the house and went up the stairs, and flopped upon what was obviously my bed. For three whole days I remained in that room, pleading indisposition, while I practised how to make my body do what I wanted it to, and trying to contain myself, because this was truly the most frightening experience I had had in my life. I had put up with all manner of torments in China and in Tibet and in Japan, but this was a new and utterly revolting experience, the experience of being imprisoned in the body of another person and having to control it. I thought of that which I had been taught so many years ago, so many years ago that indeed it seemed to be a different life. Lobsang, I had been told. In the days of long ago, the great beings from far beyond this system and beings who were not in human form had to visit this earth for special purposes. Now, if they came in their own guise, they would attract too much attention. So always they had bodies ready which they could enter and control and appear to be the natives of the place. In the days to come, I was told, you will have such an experience and you will find it to be utterly shocking. I did. For the benefit of those who are genuinely interested, let me say a few things about transmigration, because really I have so much to tell the world. And yet, because of the vilification of the press, people have been hocused into disbelieving my story. I will tell you more about that in the next book, but one of the things I was going to do was show people how transmigration worked, because there are so many advantages to it. Think of this, which I am going to put to you as a definite possibility. Mankind has sent a messenger to the moon, but mankind does not know how to travel in deep space. In relation to the distances in the universe, the journey to the moon pales into utter insignificance. It would take many millions of years for a spaceship to travel to some other stars, and yet there is a much simpler way, and I say to you absolutely definitely that astral travel could be that way. It has been done before, it is being done now by creatures, I say creatures because they are not in human form, who come from a completely different galaxy. They are here now, at this moment, they have come by astral travel, and some of them occupy human bodies, such as did the ancients of old. Humans, if they know how, could send astral travellers anywhere transcending time and space. Astral travel can be as quick as thought, and, if you don't know how quick thought is, I will tell you. It would take a tenth of a second to go from here to Mars by astral travel, but in days to come, explorers will be able to go to a world by astral travel, and there, by transmigration, they will be able to enter any body of a native of that world, so that they may gain first-hand experience of what things are like. Now, this is not science fiction. It is absolutely true. If other people on other worlds can do it, then Earth people can do it also. But sadly, I have to say that purely because of the false doubt which has been cast upon my word, this particular aspect has not been able to be taught to people. Unfortunately, when one takes over a body, there are certain grave disabilities. Let me give you an illustration. I found soon after I had taken over a body that I could not write Sanskrit. I could not write Chinese. Oh yes, definitely I knew the language. I knew what I should be writing. But the body which I inhabited was not geared for making those squiggles which are Sanskrit or Chinese. It was only able to reproduce, say, letters such as English, French, German or Spanish. It is all to do with muscular control. You have had the same things even in the West when you find that a well-educated German with a better education than most English, let us say, still cannot pronounce English as natives do. He cannot get his tongue around the sounds, so no matter how highly he is educated, he still cannot say the sounds correctly. It is said almost universally that you can always tell if a man is a native of the district or not by the manner in which he pronounces his words. That is, can he manage his vocal cords as the native would, or does habit bring in certain dissonances which the native lacks? In transferring to a different body, one can do all the sounds, etc., 
because the body is producing sounds to which it is accustomed, English, French or Spanish, for example, but when it comes to writing, that is a different matter. Look at it this way. Some people can draw or they can paint. So let us say that these people, the artists, have an ability to produce certain squiggles which have a definite meaning. Now most people, even of the same race, cannot do that, and even with training, even with immense practice, unless a person is a born artist, the art forms are not considered acceptable. The same type of thing happens when an Eastern entity takes over a Western body. He can communicate in speech, and he can know all that could be done in writing, but no longer can he write in that which was his original language, such as Sanskrit or Chinese or Japanese, because it takes years of practice, and his attempts are so fumbling, so crude, that the ideographs have no intelligible meaning. Another difficulty is that the entity is Eastern, and the body or vehicle is Western. If you find that strange, let me say that if you were in England, you would be driving a car with right-hand controls, so that you may drive on the left-hand side of the road. But if you are in America, you drive a car in which the steering wheel is on the left-hand side, and then you drive on the right-hand side of the road. Everyone knows that, eh? Well, you take some poor wretch of a driver who has been used to driving along the lanes of England, suddenly lift him out and put the poor soul slap into an American car, and without any teaching and all, let him loose on American roads. The poor fellow wouldn't have much chance, would he? He wouldn't last long. All his built-in reflexes, which may have been trained for half a lifetime, would scream at having to be reversed suddenly, and, in the emergency, he would immediately drive to the wrong side of the road and cause the accident which he was trying to avoid. Do you follow that clearly? Believe me, I know this. It all happened to me. So transmigration is not for the uninitiated. I say, in all sincerity, there could be a lot done in transmigration if people could get the right knowledge, and I am surprised that the Russians, who are so far ahead in so many things, have not yet hit upon the idea of transmigration. It is easy if you can have suitable precautions. But if you try to teach these things, as I could, and you have a lot of mindless children, or press people, then the whole thing becomes negated almost before one can start. Another point which has to be considered is obtaining a suitable vehicle or body, because you cannot just jump into any body and take over like a bandit entering a car stopped at a traffic light. Oh no, it is much harder than that. You have to find a body which is harmonious to your own, which has a harmonic somewhere, and it doesn't mean to say that the owner of the body has to be good or bad. That has nothing to do with it at all. It is to do with the vibrational frequency of that body. If you are interested in radio, you will know that you can have, let us say, a super heterodyne receiver, which has three tuning condensers. Now, if the set is working properly, you get one station clearly, but, as you get on harmonics, you actually pick up the same signal on different wavelengths or different frequencies. It is all the same thing. In a frequency, one just counts the number of times the wave changes from positive to negative, etc. But when you take a wavelength, you just measure the distance between adjacent wave crests. It is the same as calling a rose by another name. But what I am trying to tell you is that if you know how, transmigration is possible. Not only is it possible, but it is going to be an everyday thing in the distant future here on Earth. But back to Thames Ditton. It was quite a nice little place, one of the suburbias of the great city of London. I believe it is also called one of the dormitories of London. There were a number of trees in the place, and every morning one could see businessmen scurrying away to Thames Ditton station, where they would get a train taking them to Wimbledon and other parts of London, so they could do their daily work. Most of the men were from the city of London stockbrokers, insurance men, bankers, and all the rest of it. Where I lived was right opposite the cottage hospital. Much further on the right one came to a sort of sports ground, and adjacent to the sports ground was a big building called the Milk Marketing Board. 
Thamesditton was a better class, and some of the voices I could hear through my open window were too much better class, because I found some of the heavily accented voices difficult indeed to understand. But speech was not easy for me. I had to think before I could utter a sound, and then I had to visualize the shape of the sound I was trying to say. Speech to most people comes naturally. You can bubble forth without any difficulty, without any great thought, but not when you are an Easterner who has taken over a Western body. Even to this day I have to think what I am going to say, and that makes my speech appear somewhat slow and at times hesitant. If one takes over a body, for the first year or two, the body is basically the body of the host, that is, it was taken over. But in the course of time the body frequency changes, and eventually it becomes the same frequency as one's original body, and one's original scars appear. It is, as I told you before, like electroplating, or like electrotyping, because molecule changes for molecule. This should not be too difficult to believe, because if you get a cut and the cut heals, then you've got replacement molecules, haven't you? They are not the same molecules that were cut, but new cells that were grown to replace the cut ones. It is something like that in transmigration. The body ceases to be the alien body taken over. Instead, molecule by molecule, it becomes one's own body, the body which one has grown. Just one last piece of information about transmigration. It makes one different. It gives associates a peculiar feeling to be close to one, and if a transmigrated person touches another person unexpectedly, that other person may squeak with shock and say, Oh, now you're giving me goose pimples. So, if you want to practice transmigration, you will have to consider the disadvantages as well as the advantages. You know how strange dogs sniff around each other, stiff-legged, waiting for the first move by the other. Well, that is how I have found people in the Western world towards me. They do not understand me. They don't know what it is all about. They feel that there is something different, and they do not know what it is, so often they will have uncertainty about me. They do not know if they like me, or if they thoroughly dislike me, and it really does make difficulties, difficulties which are made manifest in the way that policemen are always suspicious of me. Customs officials are always ready to believe the worst, and immigration officers always want to inquire further as to why, how, and when, etc., etc. It makes one, in effect, unacceptable to the local natives. But we must get on to the next book. But before we do, there is a final word in case you find it difficult to understand that which I have written about Easterners who have transmigrated being able to write their own language. If you are right-handed, write this paragraph with your right hand. Then try to do the same thing with your left. So ends the third book, The Book of Changes. Book 4 As it is now